we need identity for everything we own, right? You know, and you know, the microphone I'm using, I think I own it, but it was actually loaned to me by somebody, you know, that I podcast for. Who owns that? H how do I know? Well, I should be able to scan a QR code on it or the barcode that came with it. And and we can know, you know, that and these things are 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 you know, can only be fixed from the individual side. It cannot be fixed by yet another isolated lockdown way that every different company can do it a different way. That's the problem we need to overcome. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Frontier Talk, the world's first podcast on decentralized identity. I'm Raj Hegde, and in this podcast, we explore the intersection of identity, people, and technology. As you can see, I'm beaming with excitement today because my guest on the pod is someone I've been wanting to speak with for a long time. He is an identity institution in his own right and wears multiple hats, being a radio veteran, an advertising guru, and more importantly, one of the most prolific technology writers of our generation. He is an alumnus fellow of the distinguished Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and has co-authored two best-selling books, The Clue Train Manifesto and The Intention Economy, which I highly recommend. Here to share his take on how to build the future of identity, Doc Searles, the co-founder and board member of Customer Commons. Doc, it's great to have you on board. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I'm, I'm flattered. It's fun to be here. Um, I'd like to start this conversation off by getting your thoughts on the state of identity as we know it today. What are the problems of the status quo? It's interesting. I mean, it's certainly what's the state of civilization today? You know, it's not going to be the same later, and it's been the same all along in other ways. Um, on the one hand, if you told me 20 years ago that um, I'd still be caring about this 20 years from now and looking forward to decentralized identity um, when I thought it was the only possible solution way back when. And um, But I'm actually quite encouraged right now. I, I see an enormous amount of activity going on around SSI which stands or stood originally for self-sovereign identity. It's not, I know a lot of people, especially in Europe, seem to have a problem with the word sovereign. It has a number of older meanings. It has some political meanings today. But um, uh, I think in the sense that every individual uh, should be in charge of how they, uh, how they identify themselves uh, in, a, in a minimal way for as needed purposes. I think that's been an ideal all along that we don't, you know, what we call ourselves and the purposes for which we do, we, in the physical world, we solved this a long time ago, you know, I mean, our parents or our tribes or whatever gave us a name, we may, may we may use it in some cases, may not. Um, and uh, if we're standing in line at the store, and if your name is Michael, and it says a common name, you may call yourself, um, you know, Clive instead, and, and that, that'll do. And we haven't replicated that online at all. It's like, it's very similar to privacy. We have not worked that out either. And they're probably tied in some ways, uh, I think. But the, the goal has always been for all of us to have individual agency, I think, and not just to always solve these problems from the corporate side. And that's still a challenge. So that's sort of the state. As an antidote to this problem, um, you talk vividly about this concept called VRM, mm -hmm. Vendor Relationship Management in your book, The Intention Economy. Could you perhaps talk us through Project VRM and how does decentralized identity fit into the goals of the project? Yeah, the, the project is what I started at the Berkman Klein Center at, uh, at Harvard in 2006. It was a one-year project, like all projects there were one-year projects. It's now going into its 15th year or is approaching starting. I'm losing count at this point. Um, it's a bit like identity that way. The original idea was that um, uh, VRM stood for Vendor Relationship Management. It's actually not a, a name that we gave it. It's one that uh, appeared on a podcast. Uh, a guy named Mike Fazard came up with it saying, you're talking about vendor relationship management. And it's the customer side counterpart of customer relationship management, which at the time was an $18 billion business and is probably a $100 billion business now, entirely on the business side, not at all on our side. Um, Every CRM system wants to get scaled across all of its customers, but all of them are different and they all require a different login and password, different customer records, all the rest of it. We want scale on our side. We want scale. So um, 
we can um, uh, change our last name or our email address or our phone number or uh, any number of other things one time for every company we deal with. We should have one shopping cart we could take from site to site. Um, those are ideals that we came up with way back when. We still have not realized them, which is why it's now in its 16th year or whatever it is. So, But we have hundreds of people on the list and we're working on it. Awesome. Um, and as you might know, um, today there is a deep dysfunction in the way institutions manage our data. Um, what do you think are some of the top priorities for anyone looking to build decentralized identity solutions? I think it's working for the individual. I think it's the only answer. I think that we're none of the approaches that are, are hot right now, including and pro, especially SSI, um, n none of them are focusing hi highly enough, I think, on giving us, each of us, the tools that we need. Um, we, we should be able to present verifiable credentials to whoever needs them on an as-needed and minimally disclosing basis where we can trust what happens at the other end. Uh, in, in design, SSI does that, but I have not yet seen what I call the invention that mother's necessity. You know, I mean, the first time you saw an iPhone or an Android, you, you said, I have to have that. The first time you saw apps coming from a store, you said, I have to have that. Farther back, you saw, you saw a copier, you saw, um, you know, an inkjet printer before that, a laser printer. I, like, I had to have that. Um, we need that for SSI. We need that for identity, or we're just going to be stuck with the administrative identities we've had all along. Right. And to add to that point, um, Dr. Harry Behrens, the former head of blockchain at Daimler Mobility, said on this podcast that identity is a means and not an end. Um, I'm curious to learn your thoughts on should the development scope be focused on a specific use case or, or or human agency? What's your take? I think the way to the way to look at it is that we need scale. the The kind of agency we need is scale for us. If if Daimler Benz has all the best technology in the world for managing all the identities that, or the identifiers or the, the namespaces and customer records they have. That doesn't help a bit for any of us. You know, I, I, and I, I want all of us to be able to, again, you know, be able to let, you know, let the company know, yeah, I have one of your cars. Yes, I have this, you know, here's a credit report. Here's some other thing. But, I should be able to do the same with all the companies. And again, I should be able to change my records with all of them at one time, at one time. And I actually haven't seen very much in SSI that even begins to think about that. But I think we have to think about scale for us. I think it's essential for people on the enterprise side to think, to take off their enterprise hat and think of themselves as individuals again. How do we, how do we as individuals bene benefit from something that works of scale for all companies. And on the corporate side, they have to stop thinking that our, our, our namespace, our records of our customers, especially for marketing purposes, are sacrosanct, and we can't share anything with anybody else. For many years, we've dealt with that with federation on the identity in, for identity purposes. But, um, but corporations, I mean, I said this in like 2001, you know, corporations sharing personal data um, with other companies is you know, is having safe sex in a way. It's not really, it's not really helping the customer. Um, you know, we need, we need scale for us. And it's just essential that companies, you know, people working at companies think of the, think of themselves first, but just how can I get what I need out of this? Right. That serves as the perfect segue to my next question. Now that we've focused on the what and why, I think it's time to shift the focus on the who. Um, individuals, as you know, have, a contextual understanding of identity and agency. Um, my perception of identity, for instance, might be entirely different to yours. And so my question to you is, who ought to be building decentralized identity solutions? And more importantly, um, is there a need for a multidisciplinary systems thinking approach to overcome any bias associated with a dominating context? Well, I think that Obviously, something needs to be done on both the corporate and the personal side, so the two work together, and and that multiple companies are working on the same thing. Um, 
I think, for example, that uh, the Linux Foundation does an amazing job of getting together everybody that's working on distributed cloud um, for 5G. You know, that's that's one of the things they're working on. They're doing the same thing with blockchain, um, with the Hyperledger project. I think it wouldn't hurt here to have an entity of some kind that comes in and says, "What do what are what's the same thing that all you guys are doing? What are you doing that's low level and common enough that we can make this thing work?" Um, and there probably some of that's already happening. The the, the Sovereign Foundation, uh, for example, that my wife has been involved with, uh, uh, has is one of those institutions, I think. But um, to me, that's the multidisciplinary side of it. The two disciplines that matter really are the are the individual and the company. How do we work for the, for both of those at the same time? And for, on the company side, it has to be what do all of us have to do in common that you know that will be base level. You know, it's kind of like what happened with the browser way back when. It was like everybody, you know, before the internet came along and before the web came along, you know, we had separate online services and they were all different. And, um, you know, but the internet made it possible for every company to look at HTTP requests coming in and saying, oh, I can send out a file. They can look at that in a browser. Um, in many ways, the and, and you, you started by mentioning the customer's own perception of identity. I think it's actually very simple. Everybody thinks of their identity as cards that the companies give them. They have these in their wallets, you know, and in some cases it's like, you know, there there are are uh, government ones, uh, uh, driver's licenses, passports. Uh, in India, they have Aadhaar. Um, there are lots of those, but still, it's still a card. It's still something I present. And now they're beginning to think, well, you know what? I can also do something with a QR code that somebody shows me, and my phone is is acting as my agent or my proxy. But in many cases, I think it's not clear to people that a QR code is for anything other than getting your menu or something like that, you know, or registering something. But I think there are a lot of opportunities there to pry people away from the understanding of an identity as something they only get from a company like this is, or from a government. This is my government ID or something. But rather, you know, I just need to say I'm over 18 so I can get into this movie or I can drink or I can vote or I can register for this or I belong to this club. And if that's all you need to know, you know, loyalty programs can be improved enormously if somebody has a collection of verifiable credentials that say, you know, I'm a member of CVS, I'm a member of Walgreens, I'm a member of, of Tesco, I'm a member of, you know, of Aldi or whatever the company is, where that's all they need to know. They don't need to know, you know, where you live, they don't need to know all this other stuff. And this is good for these companies as well, because they're not carrying records that could become stale or obsolete as soon as the customer changes anything or they get sold or they get attacked. You know, it, it, it reduces their exposure in the marketplace. I'm not sure how clear that is to companies yet. It's probably getting clearer. Um, but there are mutual benefits involved here with minimum disclosure for, um, you know, for verifiable purposes. Let's shift gears now and talk about the internet overlords. Um, speed to scale is a critical factor in consumer internet companies. Um, and as a result, product managers in the Valley tend to build products on the assumption that their users are A, lazy, and B, not very smart. My question to you is, can a highbrow decentralized identity tech stack reverse this trend? It can if the UI just wants to be used. I, I mean, I think, um, and I don't know what that UI would be. I think obviously it has to be accessible through your phone. I think phones have become uh, extensions of people. Um, Marshall McLuhan says that all new technologies are extensions of our, our bodily selves. Our bicycle is an extension of our feet. You know, our glasses are extensions of our eyes. That When you're driving a car, you, you feel like, your body is in that car. It's an embodied thing. Our phones are like that now. I, when I ride, I ride in subways in New York now, and it's rare that I don't see everybody looking at their phone or plugged into their phone and listening to something. These things have become as much a part of us as our clothes. So I think for now, at this moment in history, it has to work with your, with your personal devices, uh, your portable personal devices. But, but the, the, the UI has to be so 
obvious and necessary that's on the front page. It, it's not something you look up on your phone and you have on page two, three, or four of, of your, of your apps. It has to be on the front page of your apps. What is that? You know, and nobody's invented that yet. And we need that invented. And why should large companies be incentivized to do so? What is the business value of decentralized identity? I, th I think there's enormous business value in it because, it, 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 again, it's because you've reduced exposure. Um, you're putting the customer, you're putting the individual in charge of, of data that you need to know. You know, did they get married and change their last name? Did they change their address? You know, I've read that the uh, the Royal Mail in the UK loses like a billion pounds a year because people change their addresses and they don't know about it, right? But if a person is able to change their address one time for everybody they deal with um, and then have a simple way to to make themselves known, um, you know, for what Kim Cameron, uh, formerly of Microsoft, called a constrained purpose, right? Minimum disclosure for constrained purposes justifiable parties. These are his laws of identity he wrote in 2004, but they apply today, especially. And I think actually only SSI can make that happen. But the, the business incentive is there, there's less exposure, there's less loss, there's less friction in the marketplace. I mean, certainly there's friction in your, in, in your, in your life when you carry multiple keys in your pocket and many cards in your wallet. And, and if your wallet gets stolen or whatever, I mean, that's an even worse situation. I think we're we're moving toward the times when pretty much everything that you need to present on a verifiable basis in the world is going to be on your mobile device and that you should be able to survive its loss or, or theft. And, and I think, you know, Apple and Google are working on that pretty hard. And I think that they're making some progress with that. But for all the apps that run on that, I think that identity is a monstrously huge opportunity. But companies can't get there if they're busy thinking how only they can win because it has to be a win for everybody. Like the, the internet was a win for everybody. The, the, you know, SMS, all these things were, were wins for everybody. They need to think about what's the win for everybody. Right. Machine learning and AI enables mobile just like the browser unlocked the true potential of the internet, or at least we're on that way. Um, according to you, what needs to be done to make decentralized identity a reality? I think we need our own ML and our own AI. Um, I think if the only AI we have is what Google or Apple or anybody else gives to us, we're, we're lost uh, in the long run. I think, I think we need something we don't have right now, which is a really good collection of our own data. Uh, everything on our calendar, everything on our contacts, all of our belongings. All of our belongings, you know, we buy something, we get a receipt for that. That should be normalized in some way. Every receipt I get should be in a format where I can possess that. And I know I just bought this focus right I'm talking to you through, right? I have a receipt from that company that looks unlike every other receipt. I can't really scan it. I can't really make full sense of it. Um, Amazon does a really good job of telling me when things were shipped and what was shipped, but not what I paid for exactly, you know. My credit card company doesn't want its competitors to scrape, you know, the, the text if they send me a PDF or something. This is all very broken. I think the, you know, and, and, and it can be fixed if we realize the customer, the individual needs to be in charge of this data and they can make better decisions. So if I have an AI that's looking at, all, I'm looking at my bookshelves over here. What are all the books that I own? I should have a library of those. I should be able to scan the ISBN number on the back of every book, have a record of those, and I'll know I'm not going to buy it twice, you know, or I can get rid of these. I can put these on the market. There's all kinds of things I could do with those. I can insure my belongings, you know, and, and, and you know, where this, where this goes to identity is all, we need identity for everything we own, right? You know, and, you know, the microphone I'm using, I think I own it, but it was actually loaned to me by somebody, you know, that I podcast for. Who owns that? H how do I know? Well, I should be able to scan a QR code on it or the barcode that came with it. And, and we can know, you know, that, and these things are, 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 you know, can only be fixed from the individual side. They cannot be fixed by yet another isolated lockdown way that every different company can do it a different way.
That's the problem we need to overcome. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And to add to that, you've blogged about this concept called PICOS, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, coined by... Or PICOS, doesn't matter. There's no no orthodox pronunciation. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, (laughs) it's a term coined by by Phil Windley. Um, Yeah, Yeah. could you elaborate more on on this concept? Yeah, it's called a persistent compute object. And and the idea is that, as as I just said, that everything you own or you can identify, can have it and its own unique identifier. But it's not just an identifier. It should be a programmable um, instance on the internet. It should have its own um, node, its own little cloud that's programmable and, uh, and, and made fully useful. So, for example, with, with this Focusrite that I just got, this, for people who don't know what a Focusrite is, this is the company that makes the device that I'm talking through right now. It's very useful for podcasts. And... Um, And they're a leading company in this. And they just gave me this very difficult thing to go through that delayed our conversation today because they just bought it. Um, And it's still not working quite right. And I have to go through a bunch of videos and other crap on their on their website. I don't know if I I have another focus right thing. I'm already registered with that. How do I recover that? I'm not sure I remember it. That should be in a database of mine. But I should be able to give this thing. Either it comes with a Pico, a persistent compute object of its own, or I create one for it. And through that one, I can communicate back to the company everything I've done with it. Like, hi guys, I just went through your difficult registration process. I could have, that could have been much shorter. Here are some improvements to it. Or, you know, it'd be really good if the, if the XLR connection on this was on the back and not in the front because I'm dealing with too many cables coming out of the front of this thing. Or if I had a second connection in the back. There are lots of ways I can think of as a customer to improve this product. All the products that we own I mean, in en masse, the customer base knows more about every product a company produces than, than the company itself does. The, the, the curb weight of intelligence about every product that, that, that you can get is much higher on the customer side than it is on the corporate side. And it'd be, it'd be great if we had our own way to, on our, that's standardized on our part to communicate, not only to, remember everything that we own or that we've rented. And by the way, every subscription that we have, we're moving into a subscription economy here right now. You know, all of us here in the U.S., you know, not all of us. Do we have a subscription to Hulu and Roku and Apple and Amazon and all these other ones all at the same time? When do they come due? How do they trick us into do, to staying on after the cheap thing at first? Why am I paying so much to this guy? There should be picos for all of those as well, where I have a way of remembering when this thing comes due and when they're going to charge me more downstream. And also killing that whole system. That's a, that's a, that's a screw the customer system that is very common in marketing and has been common in marketing from way back in the physical age before we had the internet. And it's lingered in, it's a relic of the industrial age that we can fix now if we actually own our things and own and, and can process the data that we have about everything in our lives. And every company is busy thinking of ways to improve their lives as companies, but not about how to improve our lives as customers across all the companies we deal with. Picos are one way of doing that. SSI is another way of doing that. Um, but I think we've got a long way to go. The pandemic has brought about significant changes, not just on an individual level, but also on a business level. Um, has the pandemic accelerated the development of decentralized identity initiatives? What's your take? It has to the degree that we have become decentralized as workers. Um, Many of us are working at home now. um, And and I know uh, from talking to our, our son who's 24 and works in staffing for that matter, that's his, that's his profession. Um, that in his generation now, it's considered bad form for a company to require people to come into work. You know, Apple had a revolt with it. I mean, you never hear about that from Apple, you know, but people don't want to come into their beautiful new building as much as they used to because they'd rather work at home. They're working on their computers. What do you, it's nice to be around other people. And it's nice to get free food and stuff like that. If you're in a wealthy company like an Apple or a Google or whatever, but, um, if you're working in a non-private cubicle in a hive in a company, that's not as attractive as it used to be. Um, 
I think so. We're becoming decentralized to begin with. How, I think this cannot help but have an effect on what goes on with identity. What it's done specifically, I don't know. I think I'm sure that it has changed what programming is done, what thinking out loud is being done, what planning is being done at different companies um, on the work that they're doing. But I think it'll also be probably years or decades before we see the full effect of what the pandemic has done. I think it's, for some things, it has moved things forward 10 years or more. For other for other things, it's it's made no difference at all. So it kind of depends. And to add to that, how fast is decentralized identity um, going to be adopted in a way that it radically changes the way individuals manage their data? I, I think it'll I think it'll be all of the above. I, um, I think that ideally it will be involved. I, I think it'll hugely take off when two things happen. One is we have a wallet or something equivalent to it through which we can present verifiable credentials on an as-needed basis as a matter of course without thinking about it, and we no longer carry around cards or even a wallet. I think that that's one change that will happen, Um, and that'll be huge. But I think another one is when everything that we own or rent or subscribe to has an identity that we or identifiers that we can manage, that we know that we have these things. We know we have all these subscriptions. We know we own all these books. We know we own these appliances. We know we're, um, you know, when we got them, what we paid for them, what rent we're paying, when it's due, and that's integrated with our contacts and calendars. You know, that, and, and so, you know, there's a standard way that if a company changes its name, it gets bought by somebody else, everybody finds out, but not through their CRM system, but because there's a Pico that, that the company knows and the customer knows, and through that Pico's back channel, as it were, that data gets changed on the customer's, on the customer's own database. You know, so we have, an, we have name spaces for everything in our lives, and we can perform AI and ML and all that on that stuff. And I see very little thought going into that so far. Right. I think now is a good time to address the interoperability issue. Um, today, we're seeing a large number of entities, particularly in Europe, um, be it governments, enterprise, and startups, coming together in a cooperative manner to build decentralized identity solutions for a wide range of industries. Um, my question to you is, how can such entities, in a sense, come together to build an interoperable standard that enables and facilitates a wide range of use cases across the public and private sector? I think the main thing is that uh, competitors need to recognize that there are low-level um, functions that they all share, and they need to share in order for the whole market to grow. Um, and that, that might involve creating a consortium. It might involve simply cooperation on GitHub between uh, developers. It may involve um, going to the IEEE or the ITF or some other, um, or the W3C or any one of the standards organizations and and creating a standard there uh but the the main thing is that uh it's a it's an it's essential for every company operating in this space to understand that un, unless that unless you have something that's held in common at the at 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 a base level i wouldn't even call it a low level at a base level uh where everybody gets along because they all you know it's helpful you know we're we're all in we're in the web right now talking and and you know that's on HTTP sitting on top of um, of uh, H- uh, TCP/IP. Neither one of those things makes money. <laughs> you know, TCP/IP doesn't make any money, and because it doesn't make any money, everybody makes money using it, so or can make money if they choose to. And I think that's um, that's sometimes called because effects, meaning you make money because of it rather than with it. And I think that's the key thing for companies developing in this space that they realize that. There are some things they'll make money because of rather than with, and uh, and that's and it's which is essential to agree on what that stuff is. I'm curious to know what is the next area of innovation that Doc Cells is most actively wrestling with at the moment. Uh, it's um, a completely new thing operating outside on the internet, but outside of the web, outside of big platforms, outside of everything else, uh, called the intention byway. Um, a developer stepped forward um, who 
uh, who read my book, The Intention Economy, and said, I have some code that can help you do that. And so, uh, and that's code that will give all of us agency to um, express our intentions in the marketplace uh, outside of uh, the usual channels and basically building a new infrastructure uh, at, a, at a base level for for that will improve the degree to which demand can inform supply. This may involve identity. It may not. It probably won't at, at first. It's just addressing in the same way as the um, email is not about identity. It's about addresses. You know, your your email address, you know, can be a list of numbers at at IP address, you know, it, it could be anything. Uh, in a similar way, this is addressing as well. We're dealing with it at a fairly low level. But there are three places, uh, at least in the world, that have uh, expressed an interest in that. And for that reason, at one of them in Bloomington, Indiana, here in the U.S., um, uh, my wife Joyce and I are going to actually go there for the next uh, for the next uh, uh, the next academic year and work on that uh, with friends at Indiana University. So. So we're, we're going to be working on the ground on this thing. So that's what's got most of my attention right now. That's fascinating, Doc. Good luck on this initiative. Thank you. Um, I started Frontier Talk with the motive to accelerate my rate of learning. Um, with Frontier Talk, I get to sit with whoever I want and explore impactful stuff happening at the edges. Um, you've been a prolific blogger for over two decades now. Um, and I'm curious to know, what keeps you motivated? What's your raison d'etre? Mm. You know, I'd love to learn from your expertise. To, to me, what what keeps me going is the work. It's not it's not what I write. I my work was writing for most of my life, actually, and um, all of the long time that I was involved in marketing and broadcasting and other things like that involved other kinds of work. But but right now, I just want to see um, tools and services come into the world that help. Um, individuals and the companies and the organizations that serve them work better together. And, uh, and I have some influence on that. And, but the influence I have right now is actually on, for the first time really is on code rather than the writing that I do. Uh, and it's on activism. It's on, on working with the community saying, here's some code, here's some tools, use these things and let's see how it goes. Uh, that's a new thing for me, actually. Uh, I've helped with that in a, in a promotional way in the past for other parties, but not on my own. Um, so that's a new thing. As for what's happening in journalism in general, which includes blogging and includes social media and everything else, that is way up in the air right now. I mean, everybody can be a journalist now, and um, everybody with a phone can perform journalistic functions. This has utterly changed the way everything's being done. I also think social media is temporary. I think it's a, it's a hack, which is one reason why I'm kind of against governments jumping in and saying, let's break up Facebook, let's break up Google, because these are, all these companies are projects. They've been around tech for long enough that I, I realized that every company you can name in the tech world is just a project or a collection of projects. IBM ro ruled the world for many years, and AT&T here in the US and the PTTs in Europe and elsewhere in the world ruled telephony for a long time. And those are all out the window. They're all doing different things now. It's, there's no, the assumption that anybody is in charge at the moment is, I think, illusory and temporary, but tech moves too fast. And also, and I think it's an important thing um, for everybody, is that this is early. We've, we've had the internet as we know it now only since 1995. That's when the commercial web showed up. Um, and we kind of standardized on browsers and websites and that's like 25, 26 years. That's not much time at all. We're going to be digital for the rest of time, I think. As a species, we're going to be digital as well as analog, as well as physical beings. And we have a long way to go and many, many changes to go through. And so, and, and I'm very optimistic about most of them. I, there are things you could be pessimistic about, but I tend to be an optimist because optimists get more done. So. Right. And could you perhaps elaborate on how the internet realized the dreams of early techies? By coming into existence. I, I, I saw the internet coming in the 80s and envied the ability of people in universities and large companies uh, and in government to be able to use this TCP IP thing and the things you could do on it, which at the time were, I you know, Finger and Gopher and, you know, IRCs and stuff like that. Um, 
And it wasn't really until the mid nineties that I was able to get on, get my own domain name and the rest of it. But to me, I mean, if you look at a movie like that's about the future that's set in the past. So like 2001 is a good example, but a better one is Blade Runner. Um, uh, Blade Runner starts out with the on, the, on the title page, it says, Los Angeles, November 2019, right? And it's the future with flying cars and off-world colonies and human replicants, but they still have pay phones and old-fashioned looking computers, right? And But if you went back to then and said, and oh, by the way, only one of the 19 um, companies that got product placements in that, that was a pioneering movie for product placement in, in uh in in um uh in movies only one of them i think it's ibm maybe it's at&t still exists at least in name but there are there there are tape companies and other atari and others that are long gone and that's a lesson but if you went back to then if you went back to 1981 and whenever it was that that movie was filmed and said you know there's going to be a future where everybody in the world at no cost is zero distance apart and can look at each other and talk to each other on little rectangles that they carry around in their pockets or that they put on their desks. Um, I, it, it would be a miracle on the order of loaves and fish. I mean, it, it was unthinkable at the time. And the internet made it thinkable, but it didn't happen. You know, it was thought up in the 70s and 80s, but it really didn't happen until the mid-90s in a serious way. And it really didn't become portable until... Um, until smartphones with uh, app stores came along in 2008. So, and that's only 13 years ago. That's not very long ago at all. Um, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm sort of blown away by how much the internet became exactly what I wanted it to be. I'm disappointed that, you know, I co-wrote a book called Clu The Clutre Manifesto in 1999, came out in 2000. That was regarded as probably the alpha cyber utopian book. And, um, and it was cyber utopian because we, the, the opening clue in it said, we are not seats or eyeballs or end users or consumers. We are human beings and our reach exceeds your grasp. Deal with it. That was a, a little graphic sent around by Chris Locke, one of our authors to the others of us. And that motivated us to get going. But that is not yet true. Uh, our, 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 we are still seats. We are still eyeballs. We're still end users and we're still consumers. And our reach does not exceed the grasp of the companies that want to spy on us. And frankly, I think having governments come along with the GDPR and the CCPA and other things have actually made things worse by ramping up the inconvenience of using the net, um, with consent notices and other crap like that, that have really slowed down work there and created a, a gigantic cottage industry in, in circumventing those very rules um, to continue doing surveillance, as if surveillance does us any good at all, and it doesn't. For the most part, it does not. The notion that we're getting perfect advertising is ludicrous and expensive and wrong. And But I also think it's temporary. I think it's, it's taking a while before companies, as well as the people who set up their ad blocking and tracking blocking and the browser makers like Apple and Firefox is saying, stop it, stop it already. Brave is another one. We're, people don't want this crap. Um, but let's do something better. But I don't, I don't think we're going to do it with browsers. So I'm very optimistic about moving past the internet, the, the internet we see today to one that we imagined in the two, in, in the nineties. <laughs> I still want that internet. And, but I'm glad for the one that we have. I just want the next one that we're not getting yet. Do you see any similarities between the early days of the internet? and the state of blockchain as we know it today? Yeah, it, it's, it, it, yeah, there are similarities. There are similarities in the sense that it's, uh, um, there are fad-like qualities to it that uh, are going to prove useful and that, that mask what can be done usefully in the long run. I mean, a blockchain is a distributed database. That's basically all it is. And um, you can do more with it than that, but that's basically what it is. It's a distributed database. That's a nice idea. Uh, it's going to be good. There's going to be a lot of good things we do with it. I love the enthusiasm that went into it. Uh, I think the monstrous amount of money that could be made um, with cryptocurrency is a red herring. Although I wish that on day two, when I saw blockchain was there, I mean, Bitcoin was there, that I didn't put a hundred bucks into Bitcoin, but you wouldn't be talking to me now. I'd be on an island somewhere, perhaps. Um, but um, 
but that's a but that, again that's a red herring i think it it's not representative of what the basic idea is um an interesting case for me is that um uh when qr codes which were invented by an, a company for toyota for tracking car parts in i don't know the 80s maybe or the 90s along with barcodes you know but qr code is especially people in the tech world um ridiculed it calling it robot barf and stuff like that we couldn't get along without them now and it took what 10 years 12 years before qr codes became fully useful and i think we're in a similar position now with 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 blockchain we've we've gone through the fad period um we're going to figure out what what's good with it and we saw it with ssi ssi doesn't have to use blockchains but a lot of the thinking about ssi went into blockchains at first but you know, Kerry, K-E-R-I, is one that, uh, an approach to SSI that does not use blockchains. Uh, there are others. Um, uh, I think we'll have to go through a lot of fun before it becomes mundane and then fully annoying. <laughs> so that's, that's the next step. Fascinating insights there, Doc. Right. It's now time for Frontier Fire. Well, the, the best part of the podcast, yeah? Where I put my guests on the spot and ask a series of rapid fire questions to them. Okay. So, Doc, are you ready for the challenge? Yeah, sure. Go for it. Awesome. Let's get started. What's your mantra in life? Uh, be useful. Just be useful. Leave the world better than I found it. That's sort of, that's the big one, but be useful. What's a book you would recommend to our audience? Uh, Laws of Media by Eric and Marshall McLuhan. That's Marshall McLuhan and his son, Eric. What's your take on NFTs, non-fungible tokens? Are they overrated or here to stay? Uh, I think they're both, I think they're overrated and here to stay. <laughs> Interesting answer. Um, the EU is not software-centric traditionally. Do you see Europe being the hotspot for decentralized identity? It already is. I, I, so, so my wife is involved with uh, uh, the Sovereign Foundation and lots of uh, decentralized identity stuff. Most of her conversations are with Europe. <laughs> so it was Europe and Utah in the U.S., strangely so. Go figure that out. A person who inspires you and why? Oh boy, my wife, uh, more than anybody else. Uh, she inspires me on a constant basis and she's a partner in pretty much everything I do. There's an entity called Doc and Joyce and, um, and, that's, and um, people know that I come as a couple actually and, and they're learning that, that at least half of what I get credit for <laughs> you know, it comes from her. So yeah. And finally, What's your advice to anyone listening to this podcast? Uh, don't give up on any, on any aspirations and listen to everybody. Uh, it's, um, I learned yesterday that the guy who has won the most in the TV program here in the U.S. called Jeopardy. It's basically a quiz show, but you have to be very knowledgeable in order to succeed at that show. And he said, I listen to everybody without a filter he, he, if somebody says something that's important enough for them to say, he wants to listen. He doesn't listen for the purpose of dismissing or looking for a time to interrupt. And I think that's critically important. It's very, it's very typical of people to think, to be in conversations where they're really looking for a chance to say what they're thinking rather than hearing what the other person's saying. Wise words there, Doc. <laughs> um, and on that note, I'd like to thank you for your time and hope that this conversation has um, given a lot of food for thought to our audience. Um, I am sure that your work will go a long way in dismantling barriers that accelerate the development of a future identity ecosystem, hopefully giving individuals more independence and a better means to engage with society. Thanks, Doc. And, and my pleasure. This has been great. That was Doc Sells. Doc will be delivering a keynote at the European Identity and Cloud Conference, EIC, so be sure to get your tickets via the link in the description box below. Um, I hope you enjoyed this incredibly insightful conversation. And I personally would love to hear your feedback. It would be awesome if you could share this with anyone who might benefit from this information. Until next time, I hope to see you again on this incredibly fascinating journey to redefine the I in identity. Stay safe. Stay informed. Cheers. Cheers.